Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. How you doing? This is Eric. How do you preach the Word of God or teach the Word of God when you are discouraged or disheartened? How do you preach the truth when you're torn up and hurt? As Charles Spurgeon would say, you preach to adversity. And that's what I'm going to attempt to do Lord knows, with a heavy heart. We begin anew in chapter 6 of Mark. And we come to a very good portion of the scripture where Christ is returning home. He's a, home, he's a hometown boy. And you would think that his reception of him coming home would be highly celebrated, highly touted, and very important for Nazarenes. I mean, first of all, these are his people, a lot of his family, cousins, brothers, sisters. I'm sure James was there, his brother. And it's amazing that when reading through this, through this beautiful word of God, that we come across disbelief from his own people from his own people disbelief from his brothers and sisters disbelief and it doesn't take a rocket science scientist to see the overwhelming sadness that Christ will be overcome with later in the in the chat later in this very first portion of these first six verses. So much so that it probably hurt him. He was amazed by their unbelief. And most of all, we can probably relate to this. We can relate to it because in some ways, when you see the background of this story, the background of this truth, the background of what Christ is dealing with, we are going through something similar. Now, you're probably asking how, that's the Messiah, this is the story of the Messiah, and that, that's true. What I'm relating to is when you have changed, or going through the process of your changing, you're the new man, when you're going through your sanctification process, Lord knows you will be questioned. Lord knows you will be attacked. Lord knows you will be questioned. And the Lord knows you will be doubted. In all sincerity, you will be hurt by some people that's very close to you. Because let's face facts. People do not like to talk about holiness. People don't like talking about the truth. People don't like talking about the word of God. And it's practical truths that how it affects our lives. They just don't. They don't want to deal with it. It's not practical to them. They need something else or somebody else to give them some revelation that just makes some sense but doesn't necessarily have to do with the Bible. Because if it has to do with the Bible, it's not realistic. I've heard this argument many times, many, many, many times. Sorry about that. And in the process of hearing these things, I still contend that the Bible is enough. That God is enough to cure a man of all his ailments. God is strong enough to save a marriage. 
God is strong enough to stop anxiety. God is strong enough to save friendships. God is strong, strong enough to heal the brokenhearted. The question is not if God can do it. The question is unbelief. Unbelief is, a, is in the Christian family just as our faith. We are surrounded by unbelief. There's still some things we don't truly believe about Christ himself. There are many that will say, yeah, the Bible, I understand what the Bible says, but I'm in the natural and it doesn't help me. T.D. Jakes once said something very similar to this when he says, you know, we, the problem why we don't deal with our emotional pains is because we seek spiritual means to address our emotional pain. And he says that you can't look to the spiritual to deal with the physical. How crazy is that? If that doesn't tell you where a common man is, where the modern Christian is, I don't know what else, what else can you telling me that my emotions, the Bible, and God has no power to change it? That's ludicrous. That's placing God much where everybody else wants to place him as either non-existent or underpowered, or he's just, you know, he can do certain things, but just certain things he just doesn't understand. The fact that our Savior walked in human flesh had all the temptations, all the temptations that could ever come across us, he has been through. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? Do you understand how serious this problem is? Jesus absolutely can relate to us. Christ can absolutely relate to us. Say it again. Christ can absolutely relate to our situation. He had the same emotions as we have. Same hunger, same thirst, same weary bones, same exhaustion. He had same things that we suffer with. And yet people will say, he, he he's not the same. He doesn't understand how to deal with a human being in our, in our way of life. It's monstrous to think that kind of stuff. But people do. Many brothers and sisters in the faith, genuine believers, will think the Bible is, is only as good until there's some, some practical means that comes up. And then it just doesn't make any more sense. The truth is, that's unbelief. It's not that the Bible doesn't make sense. You don't want it to make sense in that life because there's something about it that's going to cause you to want to have to change. And it's much easier to stay in our sins or our own thinking. Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. We don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. He, we don't have a high priest that doesn't understand what we're going through. We have a high priest that absolutely understands what we're going through. In the contemporary English version, what I read before was the NIV. The contemporary English version says, Jesus understands every weakness of ours because he was tempted in every way that we are, but he did not sin. The Good News Translation says our high priest is not one who cannot feel sympathy for our weaknesses. On the contrary, we have a high priest who was tempted in every way that we are, but did not sin. Christ knows what we're going through. God is the God of all comfort. God knows his people. If you are his child... You are saved by Christ. You are God's people. Do you understand, brothers and sisters? We belong to God. And when God, when we can't understand, or well, basically when we believe that God can't understand us, we're falling down a, tra a rabbit hole that we cannot come back out of very easily. It's dangerous. 
to believe that somehow the Bible cannot correct a situation that is way out of control. Unbelief amongst our own brothers and sisters is very serious. It's a very serious problem. And it must be dealt with. And it must be dealt with accordingly. Let me segue into Mark chapter 6. And we start at verse 1. He went away from there and came to his hometown. And his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished. Where did this man get these things? They said, what is this wisdom given to him? And how are these miracles performed by his hands? Isn't this the carpenter, the son of Mary and the brother of James? Joseph, Judas and Simon. And aren't his sisters here with us? So they were offended by him. Then Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his household. We can relate to this in a way. So he was not able to do any miracles there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Now, we got to talk about this very seriously. Because this is where I truly believe the rubber meets the road. God has intended that his word walks in shoe leather. It has to be not only functional, it not only is capable of handling and, and dealing with the, man, with, with, with the fallen man that we are, but it is absolutely and 100% able to deal with all problems that we deal with in our Christian life. Matter of fact, we can't live our Christian life if it wasn't for Christ interceding for us every day. The Holy Spirit constantly interceding for us every day because we do not have the power to live the Christian life without assistance. We don't have the strength nor the capacity nor the, nor the morale structure to live the Christian life if it was not for the Holy Spirit constantly interceding on our behalf. Why else have we been given the comforter? Why else were we given the comforter to comfort us in our weaknesses, to hold us up when we're falling down? When we read our word of God, we go to it in faith and we go to learn what it is God is going to show us. These are the things that we must always keep in mind. We must be willing to fight the good fight. We must be willing to fight against the unbelief. We must be willing to go against our own thinking. Because if we don't, we will never make it. We'll never make it. And to, just, to, just to understand and marvel at the idea that for 30 years, these men and women, brothers and sisters, people in his own hometown... When he finally came back and revealed who he was, they were offended by him. Now, to go to the whole story, you got to go to Luke chapter four to kind of get what was so offensive that he said. What was so dastardly that Christ said that had them all up in arms and tore up? If you go to Luke chapter four, verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind and to set free the oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In verse 20, he then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. He began saying to them, today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Here's where their unbelief hit them. This is where their unbelief became gracious. Listen to that word itself. Gracious. Chorus or charis. It means in a literal manner. To influence upon the heart. It has a touch of the divine. So they were saying. His, he, there's an acceptable benefit to his words. His words had a divinity to them. There was such a, an influential and spiritual aspect. To his words when he read that scripture. Of course he could because he is the very word of God. It is very, the very thing he wrote. So it, it's amazing that the author and writer of the Bible is now reading or the scroll at the time. So the very author and writer is reading what he wrote about himself. Of course, it's gracious amongst them. They're eating it up. They're taking it down as choice morsels. This is good healing food for them. It is spiritual food. It is the very life bread that they're living off of if they just didn't fall into the next category. Because as much as they were amazed by his gracious words that came from his mouth, yet they said, isn't this Joseph's son? And Mark is like, isn't this Mary's boy? Isn't that mama's boy over there? How, wait a minute, time out. How is he telling us about this? Now it makes sense when they start asking these questions, right? Now it makes sense when they go, what is this wisdom given to him? What is this wisdom given to him? Now, don't get confused. Christ has been doing this for quite a while. For 30 plus years, he has been going to this synagogue and reading. How do we know that? We go back. We go back to verse, verse 16 in Luke chapter 4. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And look at the word. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. This was a normal thing for our Lord and Savior. This wasn't a surprise. Hey, this wasn't a secret. He's done this before. He's made a history of this so far. 30 years they've known him. 30 years they've known that he will go to the synagogue and he will read and he will teach. This happens every day. For 30 years. Matter of fact, they wasn't they can't be too surprised. Because in Luke 2:52, we get, to, we get to see this. As Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and man. They, they saw his growing wisdom. They can't say they were ignorant of it. They can't say that. Something was going on in them. They were wrestling with a problem inside them. They were struggling with something. And that something is un. Belief. Unbelief is what they were struggling with. They could not accept that this Christ is who he says he is. Now watch this. If you go to Luke, let's go back a few verses. Let's go back just a few verses. We got to see what Christ was doing. Look at verse 40. We're going to start. This is Luke chapter 2. Verse 40, you know, if you stick with you stuck with me this long on the podcast, you know, we're going to go through in some in depth. So we got to go through this and we got to see what the meat and potatoes is being is being thrown around in here, because this is some good food that we're eating on. This is great food. This is exactly what we need to sustain ourselves is to get the understanding of what's going on. With that, with, with Christ, as usual, into the synagogue, yet their unbelief came. 
So in verse 4, we're going to stop at verse we're going to start at verse 40 in Luke chapter 2. There the child became strong, robust lad, and was known for wisdom beyond his years. He was known for his wisdom, brothers and sisters. So this wasn't a shock to the people that's in the synagogue right now. There, there the child became strong, robust lad, and was known for wisdom beyond his years. And God poured out his blessings on him. When Jesus was 12 years old, he accompanied his parents to Jerusalem for the annual Passover festival, which they attended each year. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. Here we go. He lives there. He's a hometown boy. He's known for having wisdom beyond his years. And as he's traveling home, but Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents didn't miss him in the first day. Think about that. <laughs> There's not a parent listening to right now would, could forget their child, but they was they were just came out of a festival. They probably was very spiritual, like all of us. They're they're going their emotions and they're going through their spiritual emotions, and they're, they're traveling back home. They're probably they're a little bit tired, and they're, they're already setting plans of what they're going to do. And you know, their normal trip home. This is this is a normal trip for them. But what's not normal is they they got the Messiah with them, and they don't know. Of course, they do know. But he's thinking, you know what? He's just a regular kid. Yes, he's grown. He has wisdom beyond years, but he's still a kid. 12 years old, but guess what? In verse 44, for they assumed he was with friends among the other travelers. But when he didn't show up that evening, they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. These same relatives, these same friends are witnesses of what's happening right now in Mark chapter 6. 20 something years later, but here we are. We now know they know who he is. They know of him. In verse 46, three days later, they finally discovered him. He was in the temple, sitting among teachers of the law, discussing deep questions with them and amazing everyone with his understanding and answers. Three days. That's past. They don't know. They're frantic. Don't know where Christ is. Where is Jesus? He's not amongst our friends. He's not amongst our family. He's not amongst other travelers. What do we have to do? I'm sure Facebook messages went out. I'm sure Snapchat was blowing up. I am sure this was across all the lips in Nazareth and it was spreading around because you can't tell me Joseph and Mary were not frantic looking for their son. The one place they didn't look to was a synagogue where Christ is teaching. In verse 48, his parents didn't know what to think. His mother said to him, said to him, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been frantic searching for you everywhere. Now, that's 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 the equivalent of most grabbing, grabbing him by the ear or grabbing him under his under his arm and shaking him. But I'm sure it didn't happen. But I'm sure she had grabbed him briskly and said, why did you do this to us, Jesus? You gave us such a fright. What were you thinking? And look at what he says. But why did you need to search? He asked. You realize that I would be here at the temple in my father's house. But they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored away all these things in her heart. Praise God. Can't tell me that he was not tested. Because if that was any one of us, we would have had, we would have said some smart, sarcastic comments. Or, you know, mom, you know where I would be. You know where I should be at by now. I don't understand why you tripping. Uh, we would say any of these things. But notice Christ. He returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. He didn't cause a ruckus. He didn't cause a fuss. He was obedient. He was not tempted. And I'm sorry, he was tempted. We know he had to be tempted. Every temptation hit him, but he did not respond in sin. He responded in obedience. This is why favor was upon him. His wisdom beyond years. 
his robust nature growing in strength. Because our Savior could do what we could not. Be obedient to our parents? We don't have that skill set. I'm sure we do at some point, but we're going to lash out. You don't have to teach a kid to cross the street. You have to teach a kid not to cross the street if he has to look the other way because we don't have that kind of foresight. Christ didn't have to worry about these things. Why? Because he was obedient. What was taught to him, he received. There was no pushback against his parents. There was no unbelief that I, since I am God, and I know what you're teaching me, I already know. No, no, that didn't exist in him. Matter of fact, if we go to Philippians, you will see that Christ grew up very much like us, but he did not sin. He did not sin. It doesn't take much to look at this. If you go to Philippians chapter 2. For who he was in the form of God, verse 6, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He understands our plights. He understands our tests. He understands the sins that we have willfully went into that he could not respond to. But he, yes, was tempted. He had no disobedient spirit. He could not respond in sin at all. He could not do it. So the temptation was very real, but he couldn't respond to it. There's nothing evil in him. There's nothing about him that was conceived in evil as of all of Adam's children. When Mary was pronounced to be righteous, the fact that Joseph did not you know, make a child with his wife until after the immaculate birth, until, the, until she was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Because if Joseph would have knew his wife in a relationship sense, then Christ would have been born a sinner. And we know that's just not true. He had to be born from above. He had to be born by the Holy Spirit. He had to be given and brought into Mary in order to be brought across with no sins. It's had to happen this way. But with none of that, none of that that I just said, Christ is still sympathetic to our, to our needs and our plights. But to see these people meet him in a very interesting way that we get met is that though they heard these gracious words, though they heard these powerful words that he spoke, these words that was healing balm to them, They didn't take it that way. They couldn't get past the idea that this man, the whole time, has been with them is the Messiah. They couldn't wrap their minds around that because they didn't want to. They didn't want to believe that this man is the Messiah because why? They grew up with him. They played in in the dirt with each other. They played in the waters together. They went to birthday parties together. They've been to family houses together. They ran in the streets together. They knew Christ as just Jesus. And nothing those 30 something years did he make even a hint to them to tell them anything in his families or friends or the village. Didn't tell Nazareth anything. But here he comes back. Now proclaiming the truth of who he is. Because the time is now right to reveal his true nature. They don't want to buy it. Because it's much easier for them to just see him as that carpenter's boy. Mary's boy. Isn't he just that carpenter's son? Isn't he just, man, he's no better than us. So he just rolled up one day and decided to become the Messiah. Man, please. That's what they were saying. Even the people in his own blood is telling him, man, this guy is crazy. 
You can't be serious. The, the Messiah, really? You tell me this scrawny kid that I grew up next to all these years it was Messiah, but he's just a carpenter's boy? Joseph's boy? Mary's boy? Child, please. He would be regal. He would have long, luxurious hair. He would come from a prominent family, not a poor family. He was born in a manger, for all I know. What does he know about that he was wearing tattered robes and clothes? He had just as many holes as my own son. How is he going to be the Messiah? Child, please. They weren't buying it, guys. They were not buying it, beloved. And yet... He's told the truth. The spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. We know that happened. We know that happened immediately when he was baptized. We know when he was baptized, God said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. We just read in Luke chapter two that what he was growing in wisdom. And God kept blessing him more and more. Why? Because he is the coming Messiah. We know John the Baptist preached that he was coming because he was baptizing in the Jordan, telling people, repent, for the Savior is coming. They heard about his miracles in Capernaum. They heard about his miracles in the land because people talk. People are texting. People are on Facebook. People are on Instagram. You, they're getting lightning messages about what's happening in Capernaum. What's happening down there, Galilee? What's happening in this town and that town? He is the talk of the region right now. This Jesus from Nazareth? What's Nathaniel said? Does anything good come from Nazareth? Can anything of value come from Nazareth? Isn't that crazy? But that's the way it's looked. Nazareth wasn't this well-known town. It was kind of a, from what we can read and gather, it wasn't, there wasn't much to the city itself. Made up a lot of poor farmers and fishers, more than likely. John one forty six. Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Nathaniel said, come and see. Philip, Philip had to say, look, Nathaniel, Christ is here. Wait a minute. You mean that Jesus from Nazareth? You've got to be kidding me. Can anything come good from Nazareth? You've got to be joking. Now, I know I'm running a little bit low, a low on time. I try to keep these small and short, but it's just, there's so much meat and potatoes here. But let me just try to get to, we got the pipe to this in, in, in another part. But just, just, just understand what's happening right now. The truth has been given to them. The truth has been proclaimed to them. The prophecy has been set forth right in front of their eyes. They know it because of the gracious words that had the divine on his tongue and they understood him to speak the truth. But their unbelief is what is causing this rift right now. The good news is the spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. They were the poor. They were hearing the good news. God sent him to preach the good news to them. To proclaim freedom to the captives. They are captives in their own sins. They have been enslaved. The Jewish have been in, the Israelites have been in more slavery than anyone can imagine. They have been rebelling against God from day one. They have been captive to their sins. They've been captives to the to, to Gentile nations. They have been under hostile rule by Satan. But he's said, "You're free." Proclaim freedom to the captives. Recover of the sight to the blind. He was there to open their eyes. Some of their eyes were already opened. They heard his words. They understood what he was proclaiming. They heard and believed, but their unbelief could not get shaken loose. They didn't want to get past their prejudices, brothers and sisters. 
They had their preconceived notions of who this Messiah is supposed to be. And since Christ is, is sitting in front of him and he doesn't look and act and smell like something from Hollywood. And he doesn't look like something in their imaginations. Then this cannot be the Messiah. And though he is proclaiming freedom to them, he's given recovery of sight to those that have been blinded by their sin, blinded by their, their, their nature of their own sinful ways. Have they been blinded by Satan and all of the things that he's placed amongst them? They still cannot get past this Jesus, this carpenter's boy, is the Lord Jesus himself. The one who will proclaim freedom to the captives, recover the sight of the blind, and set the free, set to set free the oppressed. How is it? How is it they reject such things? Why would they, why would they, why would they, they do this? unbelief brothers and sisters for they just like we have we cannot accept that when a man or woman gets saved by christ that from that point forward they're not the same people because we still see the same flesh we still want to see the same actions that they carry we still want to see the same things they're doing but inside something has changed something has altered them something is continually changing them and molding them into the image of God and until we want to come to come in fellowship with them and walk with them and become part of the sanctification process in the sense of being accountable holding the people accountable to each other and making sure that that brother or sister that has fallen in the sand or that brother and sister that have slipped and backslid that we're there to hold them up not to remind them see you haven't changed you're it's the same guy you're just Mary's boy you're just Richard's boy Eric you ain't changed praise God there is a change Praise God that we are freed from our sins. We are no longer captive to our sins. We now our, our eyes have been opened to the truth of God and we're no longer oppressed by the weight of the judgment against us. We are truly free. And now the hard part of sanctification and in our own prejudices, we can't look past. He's just Richard's boy. That's that same old Eric. Nothing's changed. He can't be any. He can't be no preacher. He can't be no Christian. He can't be anything. Because all he is is what he was. And the key word is was. We can relate to that. I'm sure you heard similar things. You can't be saved. You were a drug addict. You can't be saved. You murdered somebody. You can't be saved. You were selling drugs yesterday. You can't be saved. You was a thief 10 months ago. You can't be saved. You were doing dirt with me last week. You are saved, brothers and sisters. And do not let, when people can't see the true you, when you can't be given the benefit of the doubt, just understand that you are being formed into the image of Christ. That though you are still stumbling through your sins, you have been forgiven. Though you're still stumbling through your temptations, you have been freed from the judgment of so. And now God will commence the work of sanctification. And how does he do that? It's pretty simple. Of course, you know, again, people don't want to talk about it because talking about it means that the word of God is powerful. It does what God says it does. All scriptures inspired by God, 2 Timothy 3.16, and is profitable for teaching, 
rebuking and correcting for training in righteousness. Verse 17, so that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You are being corrected. This word of God is profitable to your health, your spiritual health, your emotional health, your physical health. You live by the very word of God, not on anybody's opinions, not on your own personal ideas. You live and breathe because of Christ. To the world and those that are worldly and to those who even those in the body of Christ that want to shame or put you down because you have not altered or changed at a rate of pace that they find satisfactory. Don't think that God is still not correcting you. Don't think that you're forgotten about. Hebrews 12 gives a very practical looking to. Hebrews 12 too gives a very practical way to look at this. Fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning and shame, and sat down at the right hand throne of God. That was from the NIV. The English Standard Version says, look into Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Keeping your eyes on the on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. It's beautiful, right? The NAS, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he has done this for us. He has given himself a ransom. He has paid the penalty for all the sins of you and me that we'll ever commit. And he did this obediently to God as a sacrifice. He was acceptable and accepted. Nobody else could do this work. Nobody else could forgive sins the way he did. There is no other name in heaven that salvation is found in other than Jesus Christ. So what's practical things we can take away from this? You will be shamed. They will tell you you're not saved. You are not having any fruit. You can't be anything more than where you came from. You're just what, and you can add to whatever you want that to be. You're just a whatever you were, and you'll never be anything different. That comes from the devil. And sometimes the devil can use even his our own brothers and sisters to run us down. That's why one of the most practical things we can need to do is endurance. We need to build endurance. We need to trust in the author and perfecter of our faith, Jesus Christ. We need to fix our eyes on him. We need to trust the word of God. And we will not fail because Christ is doing the work in us. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. I pray this message reaches deep into the spirit of those who've been discouraged, who've been disheartened by their past. And maybe they've not changed and at a pace that others have can find acceptable. But Lord, we know that it is your time and, and, and we have to show endurance and patience. As you continue to grow us and build us into the image of you, Lord. Lord, forgive us for our sins, knowing and unknowing. 
Forgive us for our short tempers. Forgive us for our angst and our anxieties and our unbelief, Lord, at times of not trusting your word or trusting your promises or trusting your sanctification work in our in ourselves. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Remember, you can find me on any of your favorite podcast uh, apps, whether that's Spotify, iTunes, uh, the Google Play Store, uh, Stitcher, um, Anchor. I mean, there's numerous podcast affiliates that you could uh, find uh, this this podcast in. All you got to do is look up you know, Eric Miller, E-R-I-C-K, last name Miller. You will find me and you'll find this podcast. And I'd like to say thank you to all those who have held this ministry up, prayed for this ministry, prayed for me, prayed for all those that that are, that that share this ministry and continue to to grow as I grow, and and, and y'all's dedication and y'all's perseverance in your lives by just listening to this to this podcast, by, by taking time out of your day. I cannot tell you. I know that is very, it takes time out of your day. I know that's time that you could be doing other things, but I'm so glad you spend the time with me and spend time with God. And we just uplift each other and hold each other up, Lord. And I'm just so thankful for you guys. I'm more than you can imagine that when I lose hope, the only thing that I know the things I can cling hold to is Christ and knowing that I still have to do what I've been called to do. And I know that you guys go through the same thing. So I'm telling you, hang on to your calling, continue to press forward. And I promise you, God will see us through. In Jesus name. Amen. You have just listened to You in HD, Your Identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.